Good afternoon. Just a, a reminder that we know it's past the one o'clock hour. However, there's folks still getting signed in. We're going to give you a couple more minutes to finish getting signed in. And once everyone is seated, we'll go ahead and get this show on the road. But just wanted to acknowledge that for folks who have just walked in. Okay, everyone, about five more people are signing up and then we'll get started. Oh, I work tomorrow. Hi, Hi. birthday boy. You. you feel a year older? I, I feel uh, like a boss. Okay. Oh, nice. You dress, you dress like a boss. Nice. My birthday. That's right. Sitting here with you? Oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Anytime. Yeah, yeah. Where you want to sit? Back here? Or, uh, oh, I'm right there. I'll sit probably right Okay. Yeah, yeah any, growth. anytime. Anytime. Why don't you bring up a chair? You don't have a chair? No, no, no. I just want to, I want to be with you. <laughs> we don't have another tall chair? He's wound it. <laughs> Every time I think they don't sign up, like one or more, two more people keep getting the game. Mm -hmm.
When do you leave guys home? I don't leave until Tuesday, but I got family in town. So yeah, I've been missing out on all the fun. Sir, are you signing in? I think you're our last person to sign in. Are you all done? Mr. Can we get somebody to grab that sheet for me? Okay, looks like everyone is all signed in and seated. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this joint work session between the Zoning Committee and the Community Development Human Services Committees. I am Councilmember Marcy Collier, Overstreet Chair of Zoning Committee, and I'm joined with my colleague, Councilmember Jason Dozier, and he is the chair of the CDHS Committee. Today, we are here to discuss our short-term rental policy, and that is ordinance number 23-0-1084. This legislation is dual referred to the Zoning Committee as well as CDHS. It's held in committee at this time in Zoning Committee. We will not be have taken any votes today, just managing expectations. That's not why we're here today. This is a true work session.
The city, the Department of City Planning will provide an update on the STR policy and will then be led by Prince, Commissioner Prince, that uh, and her team, they will deliver that presentation and that'll, uh, then we'll have a discussion amongst our council members uh, after her presentation. An electronic version of the presentation that's going to be shown to you today during this work session will be found on our city council website by navigating to the standing committee's web page for either the CDHS committee or the zoning committee and viewing its presentation page. I'd like to introduce uh, my coworkers. I am joined today with uh, President Shipman, Doug Shipman here today. Um, also, Council Member De Jason Dozier, Council Member... Oh, Jason. <laughs> oh, we have lots of Jasons. So, Council Member Jason Winston, uh, Council Member uh, Byron Amos, Council Member Howard Shook, Council Member ne Mary Norwood, Council Member Matt Westmoreland, and uh, that's my opening for today, and I'd like for Council Member Dozier to give you an opening as well. Thank you so much, Councilmember Overstreet. And just to echo uh, what was said, just thank you all uh, as members of the public, as stakeholders for coming today. I know one o'clock on a Thursday on a work day is not easy for everyone. Uh, and uh, we know how important it is, this issue is to you all because you are here in person. So just wanna thank you and thank you to the folks at home who are watching as well. Uh, this is something that is impacting all of us, which is why we thought it was important to host a work session uh, because this is a citywide debate that is happening in all of our neighborhoods, all of our communities, and we want to make sure we have that conversation out in the public. So just thank you all. And one thing I'll just add, I know following our internal city discussion, uh, we will have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, each of you will have two minutes to, to, uh, to speak. Uh, uh, if you don't want to speak, if your point has been uh, stated, you don't have to speak. Uh, I just want to reiterate that because I know a lot of you have signed in, uh, but um, uh, we also want to make sure that uh, we can get folks on with the rest of their business as much as we can. So I just want to reiterate that. So with that, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Council Member Overstreet. Thank you. Um, so the purpose of today, like I said, really is a work session. We will not be voting, but the purpose of a work session is to make sure that everyone understands the legislation, that everyone can give feedback as to how they feel about the legislation and also understand who was responsible for what. And that is my purpose of having a work session today is to make sure that everyone's on the right page when we leave out of here today and to hear from you. Um, I know that every time we submit legislation, it's not perfect. So this is the opportunity for us to get it right and to make sure that our short-term rental um, legislation is solid as a city and is serving uh, the correct purpose. And um, with that, I would like to introduce to you our director, our commissioner of city planning, that would be Commissioner Prince. And Commissioner Prince, you go ahead on and get started on your presentation. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Do I need to use my outside voice? <laughs> How's this? If anyone wants to play some Jeopardy music while we wait. We were joined by Council Member Lily Allen Bakhtiari, so there's that. Is it working now, Commissioner? Trying again. Thanks. All right. today. Good afternoon. Today I am joined by two of my best staff members. Director Greg Pace from the Office of Buildings. He's going to assist in the presentation. Wave. Hi. <laughs> and Elisa Baker. She is the short term rentals manager in the Office of Buildings. So she is the one who does all of the applications, processes them, and has the knowledge of the very intricate details of how all this works. Okay, no. There we go. So just to give everyone a little bit of background on short-term rentals, 
This ordinance was put into place originally to help offset the costs of home ownership so people could rent out their home or part of their home to people visiting the city. Currently, our rules limit short-term rentals to two. And everyone has to get a license. Now, here's some information about the short-term rentals that we have so far. This is uh, data um, from March 1st. And you can see here by council district where all of the licensed short-term rentals are. Because that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the licensing requirements for short-term rentals. This is handled in the Department of City Planning because we do all of the permitting for this. But this is a licensing ordinance not a zoning ordinance, and it applies everywhere in the city where short-term rentals are allowed. It doesn't say where they're allowed. The proposed changes will tell you how far apart they have to be, but not where they are allowed. So Greg Pace is going to present how we do enforcement on short-term rentals. We have recently purchased software that combs all of the short-term rental listing sites to find all of the short-term rentals that are advertised. So you'll see that there are more than are licensed. That's your sneak preview. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, council members, um, president, council member, shipmen, and others, um, stakeholders, guests, citizens. I'm Gregory Pace, I'm the Director of the Office of Buildings. Um, just to expand on our short-term rental enforcement, currently our enforcement has been delayed, has been suspended. Um, we, we're not currently enforcing any short-term rentals as we continue to go through different iterations of trying to revise the short-term rental legislation. We've been hearing some of the concerns, issues, complaints, and so, as a result of that, we've suspended enforcement as, as a result of um, those, those, some of those concerns while council member, administration, and others work through that process. And this is one of those steps in which we are trying to rectify and resolve some of the issues that we have been having in regards to the um, short-term rental legislation as it stands right now. Currently, the way the ordinance reads is anyone that has a short-term rental license, if there is a complaint regarding that license, it is enforced by the Atlanta Police Department. That's how the ordinance was read. Um, with that, if a short-term rental operator receives three or more, three violations, the city has the power to revoke that short-term rental license and any pending license applications for a period of 12 consecutive months. Currently, again, it's not being enforced, but once the enforcement date is, has been announced and established, this will go into effect unless there's some other changes. The city, Department of City Planning, more so the Office of Buildings, does the enforcement on those properties that are operating a short-term rental without a license. So when our office received a complaint, regarding a property that is using their property, someone that is using their property as a short-term rental without a license. That is, in essence, a use violation, zoning use violation, and therefore our zoning inspectors will investigate that, that complaint, issue correction notices, and go through the enforcement process. We have, as Commissioner Prince just, just mentioned, we have acquired and procured a software company called Granicus, which will help us then host compliance of short-term rental licenses. It, through their, through their data and combing of the websites, as you can see in Atlanta, they've identified over 10,000 
um, 10,000 listings representing over 8,700 unique rental units. That's within the city of Atlanta. If you remember, if you can recall the previous slide that talks about our metrics, this is less than 10% of the licenses that we have issued since the inception of the short-term rental license back in March 1st of 2022. So, of course, there's a lot of work that has to be done, and this software that we've acquired will help with combing different websites, combing different hosts to determine and find those that are not licensed or those that are licensed. It will also provide us with the ability to make the process easier for customers to apply for those licenses through the web, through their web page, through our, um, through the portal and other means that allow for that. It's also, um, it does our com compliance monitoring, it'll do our permitting and registration, 24-7 hotline, rental activity monitoring, et cetera, consulting service, all of that. Um, again, this is basically what it does. It'll do some address identification for all the different websites that host short-term rentals, um, does some compliance monitoring. Um, it also does data for permitting, registration, that thing, those things to make it easier on the customers as well. Um, a 24-7 hotline so that you can call in complaints, call in emergencies and things of that nature dealing with the short-term rental and do some rental activity monitoring. Part of that process, some of the things that it does is address, address identification. This is a short video demonstration. I'm not sure how to get that to work. There we go. Um, about, it's about four minutes, so if you pay attention to the screen, we can, um, it'll give you a detail.
again, this is the software that we will be using to try to help monitor and um, do enforcement. There's another small video as well that's, that, that I'm going to show that um, is, of course, a little bit shorter. Um, but it'll, this is going to demonstrate how we will, um, how host compliance, how, they, how we monitor and send out actual violation letters when, compli when compl complaints and when violations are found. Right. Thank you. As you can see, these are, this is the software that's going to assist us in enforcement and monitoring of the short-term rentals once we have established the final legislation and guidelines in that process. Um, it is a, it's not perfect, but it's, it, short-term rental monitoring, enforcement is a very tedious and daunting task. And without the assistance of software such as this, it'll be very, very difficult for, my, for, the, for the city and our staff to even try to enforce it. There's a lot of cases that we've had that we've had essentially thrown out of court for reasons of one or another. And so we need to make sure that we have the evidence necessary to be able to do, to do that, to do the monitoring enforcement necessary. Um, that stated also, the short-term rental process does have just as with any permit, you have a, the customer has a right to an appeal to the appeal process. The appeal process was designated through legislation to the, um, the COO who designated the, off, the, the Department of City Planning to oversee that process. Customers that feel that they were denied a short-term rental license have 30 days to appeal that decision. Um, I will say because we're not, enforcement has been suspended, all of those appeal letters that we have received since the beginning of the short-term rental license, those that have been denied, we have those appeal letters. And once enforcement date has been set, appeal notices or appeal hearing dates will be scheduled and heard during that time if the, the owner wishes to continue with that appeal. After the enforcement date has been established, um, those that apply after that will, if they're denied, they will have 30 days from that date to file an appeal, and that's through this process. And I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Prince to discuss some of the differences between the current legislation and the proposed. And we're here for questions if you have any. Thank you, Greg. So the changes that are proposed are pretty straightforward. OK, 
Councilmember Lewis was kind enough to introduce this ordinance for us. The, mo the biggest change is we are eliminating the primary residence requirement. So you can get a license for a short-term rental for a property that is not where you live. However, every dwelling unit must have its own license. And the fee is going to be $150 per license, which we have found is on par with surrounding jurisdictions and other big cities. Now for single family structures, single family and two family duplex structures, they have to be 2,000 feet apart from each other. So if there's an existing short term rental in a single family or duplex zoned property, then the next closest one can be 2,000 feet away, no closer. For multifamily structures, we have proposed a tiered system. So if the building, the apartment or condo building has three to nine units in it, one third of the units can be short term rentals. This means that every type of structure is allowed to have a short term rent, every type of residential structure is allowed to have a short term rental in it single family, duplex, triplex, on up. For apartment or condo buildings with 13 or more units in them, 15% of the units can be short term rentals. There are some additional rules for the multifamily structures. For example, if it's a condo, we're going to need some documentation from the condo board. If you're a renter in an apartment, we're going to need documentation from the property manager, property manager or owner to let us know that you're allowed to do this. You have 180 days after you submit your application to get all your paperwork in. So if it takes you a while to maybe get the letter from your condo association or what have you, you've got time to do it. Here's a map that shows the existing licensed short-term rentals with 2,000 feet buffers around them. So you can see that there's a lot of them here. We thank you for your time and attention and we are available for questions. Okay, thank you. We're gonna start with questions from our council members. Um, I would like to start first. Um, again, one of the most important things of, of today's work session for me is to make sure that everyone um, that that is you know has short term rentals or interested in this legislation have a place to to go for for better understanding of, of, of how they can weigh in on the legislation. And so for that, did, did you identify a name of, of a person that, that is dedicated to short-term rentals? I would like to write that down. Ms. Elisa Baker is the short-term rentals manager. Elisa Baker. Mm -hmm. Is there an email address? A Baker. So A Baker at a Baker. AtlantaGA.gov. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll like my co colleagues to get started. We'll start with Councilmember uh, Dozier. I'll, I'll answer, uh, Councilmember Bakhtiari. I know she has a follow-up question. Sure, Councilmember Bakhtiari. Thank you, Chair. Um, so a couple of things, thank you so much for the presentation. One of the things I wanted to make sure that I stated from the get-go to reflect the concerns of my district um, were, <clears throat> one, uh, I am very concerned about the distance requirement if it's actually enforceable. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to look over uh, and to actually um, enforce issues. I think that capping of multifamily is something that I'm leaning towards given the problem towers in my district um, and the fact that STRs are running amok in some of my towers and some of our apartment towers. I think, and I know that there's been concern about transferring of licenses. I think if we remove 
the distance requirement and focus on capping and having a grandfather period. It'll allow for any licensings to be dead upon selling of the house so that people can just reapply because we don't have a distance requirement to worry about. Um, those are some of my big ones. And I have a question about enforcement issues later and if APD is the best equipped to do that given the strains already upon them, but that's for a conversation later. But just for the kickoff of this, I am very, uh, I do not know if, if distance is the best way to enforce and regulate STRs. I think capping is great. Oh, I didn't, for the record, I did not know I get applause after that. Thank you. Um, uh, so, but also, I also want to commend you and your team for working on this and for our legal, legal team. And I know we're here for discussion, but that's just where my district stands. And I would be uh, terrible at my job if I did not put forward their concerns. Just Thank so you. you know, the 2,000 feet was recommended to us by the law department because it had worked in other legislation. Yes. Um, I know that, that we had, we're trying to tie that to the supportive housing piece. Just for the record, I'm completely and totally against the 2000 requirement on the supportive housing piece just because it can be so discriminatory um, and I also just the reason I'm recommending this is just to set up realistic expectations for us moving forward just given the legal challenges that other cities and municipal other municipalities have had with enforcement and that's just my two cents and again thank you so much commissioner thank you council member Dozier thank you so much madam chair uh, just a couple of questions one of the things I know we talked about in our multiple conversations, Commissioner Prince, uh, is with regards to grandfathering in terms of, you know, we're about to potentially uh, add in some new legislation. There's some folks who have done their due diligence and have applied for STR licenses uh, already, have been approved. Uh, and if there is a distance requirement, um, there might be uh, folks who will be caught up in that within that distance requirement, but have already been approved for STR licenses. Can you talk about or just uplift kind of DCP's per perception or perspective on what happens with those individuals? How does grandfathering work in this particular situation? Sure, if you already have a short-term rentals license, you are grandfathered. So that means so long as you renew your license timely, you can have that license for a long, long, long time. Additionally, the effective date of the new ordinance is proposed to be 45 days from adoption. So on day one, when the ordinance is adopted, until day 45, anyone could come in and get a license regardless of the distance requirements. The 2,000 feet distance requirement would set into place on the effective date of the ordinance, which is currently proposed at 45 days from adoption. Okay, thank you. And just with regards to that, I know currently uh, it was shared, we have uh, issued 1,115 short-term rental licenses or completed applications. Uh, however, uh, we've identified 10,852 listings across the city. Uh, that's a big delta. Uh, what are we doing to try to narrow that delta? Uh, is there an active partnership with the companies, the Airbnbs, the VRBOs? Uh, where have there been some gaps? Because just thinking about where Airbnb has a good neighbor policy, uh, Booking.com and Travelocity and some of these other venues don't necessarily have that mechanism in place. Uh, can you talk about that and, and what the team is doing to address it? We've been working with Amstra, which is the organization that represents the short-term rental companies. So we have done that. We have also spoken directly with Airbnb representatives, but we have not spoken to Travelocity or Booking.com. Okay, and, and the reason why I share those particular examples, and I imagine many of my colleagues can share many examples. We've had a number of conversations with um, the government affairs folks with those with the companies we all know and love and probably use ourselves uh, but we don't have any relationship with a lot of we, we tend to find a lot of the troublesome properties are booked through one of those mediums so something just to, to re-emphasize is the more we can do to address that with the companies themselves so that as we look at enforcement uh, making sure that the companies are also part of that ecosystem as well so just want to uplift that and um, I know 
we're still, I know uh, Director Price had alluded to this, is still kind of being, um, we're, we're contemplating a future date for enforcement, but if you can talk through maybe what we're looking at and what happens if this legislation passes, if it doesn't, because um, I have a lot, of a lot of constituents who are dealing with uh, party houses, dealing with all these you know, nuisance issues and need relief, and what can I communicate back to my constituents about when the city will be able to get them the relief that they need? So we have ex administratively extended the enforcement date of the ordinance to June 30th or the passage of the new ordinance, whichever comes first. Thank you. And for now, I will yield uh, back to uh, Chairwoman Overstreet, but thank you so much for uh, your responses. Thank you, President Shipman. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Um, a few questions. Uh, one, I wanna go back to your map of around where we have gotten licenses and where the listings show there are rentals. Maybe pull up the one that shows where there are rentals. Uh, no, not the buffer map, the, the, oh. the one with the snapshot of Travelocity and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, that one, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so this is where the, the algorithm identifies where they are. Do we have any sense of it, what areas of the city are uh, particularly under licensed at the moment? Do, have we seen more license applications um, per certain areas than we would expect or less? Or do we think kind of every area of the city has, has, is underrepresented when it comes to the ones we've issued? Well, currently, this, is, this was um, the software companies sweeping of a lot of the websites. We don't have that capability, but we being the City of Atlanta Office of Buildings. And so this was what was presented to us when we were looking at several different enforcement soft software. Um, in regards to the licenses that have been applied, um, presented to us when we were looking at several different enforcement soft software. Um, in regards to the licenses that have been applied, um, you can, you know, based on our metrics, if you look back at our metrics report, you'll see where concentrated most of those are in the districts that are showing as such. Okay. But I don't, I, I truly believe that because of the one lack of enforcement um, to the concerns and, and, and issues with the current legislation and without the enforcement piece, we're not probably not, we're not receiving the applications that we should receive at this time. I think once we have the enforcement in place, once we have legislation that we, that's, that's, that we agree upon to move forward with, I think we'll see a, more of an influx and be able to provide more enforcement in regards to that matter. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the, the enforcement for a minute. Is it, is it your intention that in essence this will be proactive enforcement, that the department will be monitoring the sites, seeing what is popping up, and then proactively doing this? And or what's the role of citizens to say, hey, there's a short-term rental next door and I don't think they have a license? It sounds like this is more proactive. You're gonna have staff members that are working with this vendor software to actually kind of proactively manage this, is that right? That's correct. It's going to be both. We're going to always, it's, it's going to be, in this case, it's proactive. So this software constantly monitors and sweeps it and will actually send us that information. Anytime someone hosts or has a host on their site and doesn't have a license, it'll capture their, their, um, it'll capture their listing, send a letter out letting them know they need a license. If that person actually takes it down for a week and puts it back up, it'll see it again send another, a second notice and stating that this is the second warning, you, um, you need to put, get a license, et cetera, and even that if they move it to a different site. Now, um, of course, you have those that are, some people that may have their own websites and their own way of, um, of, of advertising. Um, those we may have to, we may wind up getting those through complaints from the neighbors, et cetera, and so it's gonna be both proactive and reactive. 
Okay. And do you have any sense of how many people it's going to take to actually do this proactive enforcement? Right now, no. Looking at that number, it's, it's a team of folks that we probably, I, I, I couldn't, right now I couldn't tell you right okay. offhand. Um, this was kind of somewhat surprising, but not surprising when we did see the numbers. Um, we knew there were a lot out there, but, and we get numbers all the time from different data, different sources, but none, none definitively. So just on the revenue that potentially could offset the cost of that enforcement, the licensing side, roughly speaking, given how many listings we see, is about 1.5 million or so a year, give or take, would be a reasonable estimate. Do we have any estimate as to the, to the um, tax revenue that we think um, would come in via this mechanism that's not coming in today? I, that's out of my purview. That's gonna be um, Department of Finance, but I, I have no idea, no sir. I okay. couldn't answer that question. 8 thing. Yeah, to my understanding, it's an 8% um, tax based on their gross revenue, but I'm not certain. Right. So, so I think that, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, um, Chairs, um, I do think that's sort of an important notion, right, which is if we're, if we're putting in a lot of compliance, you know, what's the revenue, what offsets of the cost that that may have, that, that might be helpful down the road. Um, I want to talk about the buffer just for a minute. Is there, just to make sure I understand, is there, is there any relationship between the single family buffer and multifamily? No, sir, they're considered separately. Okay, so you could have, you could have multifamily, 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 multifamily on a street, as long as they're complying within the percentage within the building, doesn't matter that they're next to each other. Yes, that's right. If you had a single family on that street, you could still have a multifamily next to it, a multifamily next to that, but you couldn't have a single family within 2,000 feet, correct? Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to get clear. Hopefully you're not booting at me. Um, um, and then everyone who has a license 45 days after this is enacted would be grandfathered in. Is That's that correct? Right. Okay. So in essence, if just, for the buffer map is up. If everybody who is on that buffer map today had a license 45 days after, that would sort of lock this map in, right? It would, but it's important to note that the 45 days, if, if y'all direct us to change that, it could be sooner. Fair enough. Whatever the deadline, the, 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 the approach of the legislation would be, we're gonna have an adoption date, we're gonna have a time frame of some set time, and at that point, we're gonna lock in the single family buffer map. And then post that, either you have to be in one of the non-blue areas to get a new single family, or somebody's gotta drop out that would open up a new non-blue area. Is that a fair way to put it? Yes. Has this kind of approach been done in any other cities that you know of? It has. And has it led to um, actually pushing the market in a way that would chase the white areas for properties? Because I'm, I'm concerned a little bit about, a, a, you know, basically like Council Member Bakhtiari's district, I'm not sure there's any part of your district that's not blue in that buffer, right? But, you know, Council Member Norwood's district, right, actually has a lot of open space there. Is this gonna actually push the market or, or push people to make investments in areas? Have they seen that in other cities? Couldn't say, didn't get that level of analysis from the other cities that we spoke with. I mean, it would be an interesting, I think it would be an interesting question to ask them because, you know, if you were, if you were an investor and this were the rules, right, you, you, it, it might actually impact the market. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, I'm not sure, but I, I do, I would be very interested if in this map, Southwest Atlanta, Northwest Atlanta, some pockets of Northeast would actually see activity that they haven't seen before, if that'd be an unintended consequence of, of the approach. Um, the, the other question I have is around, um, the, the 33% and the 15%, um, those are all also standards that have been used in other cities. Is that correct? That part, I don't know. Okay. This was a, a recommendation from the law department. It was all about making sure that every structure type was eligible. Got it. So it was basically by structure type. <clears throat> and then just finally for me, 
at the moment, eliminating the primary residence requirement, do you believe that that will basically address the concern that we've heard a lot over the course of this legislation about folks who in essence have a small business in which they own multiple properties around the city. Do, do you feel like that changing that requirement will in essence allow them to continue um, operating the small business that they have today around short-term rental properties? It will allow them to operate legally. Right, so it allowed them into the process of licensing and, and allow them the option to continue to, to operate. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we are moving on to council member, you ready? Okay, we're gonna do council member Lewis. He has a um, video, it's a one minute. And, and it's one video. minute and 24 seconds. And the reason I wanna show this uh, video is because uh, this is, uh, we have two, I mean, is this the one with the shootout? It doesn't look like the shootout where the young folks are running out the house. Okay, I just wanna, these are within one football field, which is 100 yards of each other, uh, because the Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh, historic Pittsburgh community uh, that has about the majority of my 97 houses. So uh, can we play this video, please? Actually, that's the wrong video, and she'll be searching for that video to get it to us. This is actually a shootout video as well. You okay. we just can't see the bully, the bullets flying through. But I was going to ask you, was that the actual property? But that's the actual property. No, it's, that's the actual property. Okay, they so have a gun incident at this actual property. I can read the email to folks. He's actually hiding a gun for this, but you can. So that's the Airbnb property? Is that what you're talking about? That next door. Okay, we'll come right back. Okay, we'll Hold come right that. back okay. to that video. So for now, we'll go on to Councilmember Norwood. No, no, no. I got a couple of questions oh, uh, sure. around it, though. All right. And so, pardon me, I, I, I know somebody was yelling. The, uh, we eliminated the primary home ordinance because that was a issue that a lot of folks called us with. They said they didn't live in the city. Uh, some of them lived in New York. They lived in different states, and they were saying, hey, this is unfair on us because we own these properties. And so we eliminated that uh, to help folks uh, help us out on that way. The 2,000 square feet in the single family home area is a sticking point for me, but I'm actually, I was looking at 1,500 square feet. And the reason why is because I, I, I rent for a living actually. I live rent in the Polar Rock community. And my neighbor across the street from me, they've lived there for 17 years. Uh, my neighbor, when their lease came up, the rent went up $300. My neighbor no longer lives there. That house is near Airbnb. B. Uh, right next door to that one, a young couple moved in, I thought. They moved in a year ago. A cool couple. They came by my Labor Day party, actually. Uh, they come by and eat with us. But they told me that they bought the house to satisfy the primary residence issue for the city of Atlanta. The moment that we got rid of it, they moved to a golf course community in DeKalb County. Their house is now a rental, uh, now an Airbnb. And so me personally, I'm in a community where I'm seeing folks who've lived in either low income areas or affordable. It was affordable to them for 17 years, uh, being taken out of the pocket to become Airbnbs. And so when I hear, uh, I know Council Member Shipman, uh, President Shipman, he said that the, uh, we'd be pushing folks into white areas. I, you didn't, I, I'm looking at the map, at, at, at this area because of the space in the white areas, right? No. I know, I'm looking at it. No, no. The 28. It wasn't a racial comment, it was where there weren't no, the B&B. I just B &B. repeated what he said. I know, but it's because it's white on the map, not white as the community. Oh, that's because of white on the map, yes. got you. Yes, Okay, I was just making sure as we listened to that, because that was a, uh, that, that's what I heard. 
Uh, with the 28, I'm looking at the same sheet on short-term rentals license applications on the fifth page. And when you see the 97 folks that have applied in my district over the, since March 1st, 2022, and you look at the other areas, this is single family homes. This is homes that we're taking out of uh, workforce housing, out of affordable housing to become renter, ho de facto hotel districts. And it's, we've removed the primary residence factor, so we've allowed folks to make money uh, but I think that we, in talking to folks in my community, talking to the Shirley Nichols of the world, talking to the Ann Phillips of the world, and when they see people actually, they've been living there 30, 40 years. As a matter of fact, the young lady who lived across the street from me went to Sylvan Hills Middle School. I remember going to her school the next day, the next week, the next week or a few weeks later for a career day, and seeing her in the cafeteria, and, and hearing her say, I lived across the street from you, and I know life, right? I know what life is like. So I know that they moved, not because they wanted to move, but they moved because they couldn't afford that extra $300. And though they were living there for 17 years, so now they're no longer in our city. And they're finding a way to get her to that school so that she can finish the semester. And so I'm just seeing that happen all over my district in my single family homes. And I'm talking about football fields, right? And so, because if a street, some of these streets are two football fields, which is 200 yards. And so I'm just thinking about helping folks and thinking about our affordable housing crisis that we're having in the city of Atlanta. And even, I know I'm going to get the booze, right? I know some folks have been clapping. Uh, I'm probably going to get the booze on this, but the folks in my community, they're not here. Uh, they're at work. Uh, they told me to come down here and speak for them. Uh, that, that's why we were able to beat a 17-year incumbent. Uh, for the first time uh, because folks wanted their voices heard and I think that uh, I think that the affordable housing crisis that we're living with in the city of Atlanta have all us been talking about it if we see single family homes that 2000 distance requirement for myself these how, these areas in this these areas that are not heavy apartment areas it will mean a whole lot for us I'm thinking about people being able to rent in our city. I'm thinking about, because I, I, I'm also looking ahead, right? I'm also looking at the World Cup. I'm looking at the anything else that comes into our city, and I'm comparing it. Would a person want to rent an, a, a house to Antonio Lewis for $1,400 a month, or would that person want to Airbnb that house out while the World Cup is here? And I'm scared. See, America is beautiful. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America ceases to be great. And that's the way capitalism works in this country, right? Because we are good people. But when you allow the businesses to run, because this is a business. Hey, you know, people, the folks down here talking about money. They talking about money. And so I want to replace that statement with the beloved community that we in, right? We're in the beloved community. Anybody in Atlanta, you came here, I'm a Grady baby. So I'm happy that you came here because Dr. King told you this is the beloved community, and it really is. So thank you for coming. And so to be a part of the beloved community, Atlanta is the beloved community, and it is great because it is good. If Atlanta ever ceases to be good, Atlanta ceases to be great. I think that this, if we put my people out of this city, we put our people out of this city, this beloved community with white folk, black folk, green folk, brown folk work together. We've been doing it. The council mayor, the mayor Noah Woods, the Shooks and the Antonio Lewis's and the Marcy Collier Overstreet's have, and the Byron Amos's have been figuring it out for a long time. And we like when we mix all of us together, because Mayor Manny, we got a lot of mayors that weren't born here until we got our current mayor and Keisha. So we figured out how to do it. But I'm telling you that we need folks to be good people to folks in this as well. Uh, but if you're a business, let us tax it like a business. Let us look at how we tax the hotels. Uh, because it's $5, $5. I mean, I mean, what folks are paying ain't, ain't a bit, ain't, ain't Ain't the people that should be down here, but I appreciate you 
uh, council member for giving me the uh, moment to talk about Atlanta being beautiful and the reason why people came here and Atlanta continuing to be beautiful because we're going to fight for it. Thank you. No, thank you. And we're moving on to Mary Norwood. Yes, and I'd already men mentioned to the commissioner that I want to see two things done with um, the legislation and, and the procedures. One is, is for people to come down here and apply in person. I think that's important because what we want is good actors. We don't want bad apples. And all of the council members up here have seen bad apples. And we know how difficult it is to get rid of really bad behavior that is flying under the radar screen because we don't have the enforcement right now. So I'd like to see people come down in person. The second thing I'd like to see is a signed agreement between the STR owner and the city not just to have the list of uh, you can't have loud noise, you have to obey, you know, whatever. Uh, but I want to see that as an agreement between the city itself and the owners. And all of y'all that are in business and doing good work in our community, that's no big deal to you because you're going to obey the rules anyway. But I think we will have a way to get rid of the bad apples. As I said to some of y'all earlier, um, I have one nearby that the neighborhood has been very concerned about. And what they did is they have a three-bedroom house, but they set up 18 mattresses in the basement. And they have 20 people coming and going all night long. That's driving the neighborhood crazy and the neighborhood is letting me know that. We need to make sure that that kind of behavior all night long is not what we're, what you're about. You're about people coming in. You're about running a business, not an illegal business. So those are my requests. Did you need a reply? I took notes. <laughs> All right. Uh, take duly noted as a reply, and thank you. Um, and I know that Council Member um, Winston has to leave. So are you ready? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Prince, uh, for your presentation today. Uh, my first question is around accessory structures. Um, so do main, the main part of a, pro a property as well as an accessory structure count within the 2,000-foot buffer? It's from property to property. So the main structure is, if they're going to do the short-term rental as their accessory structure, then that's, it's that. Um, it's that accessory structure, and it's 2,000 feet from the property line to the next one. So I can't have my, you know, I can't put my main house on, um, I can't get a license for my main house as well as have an accessory structure that's on my existing property with a license as well, or I can do both? No, currently it's one. It's going to be you're either doing the house and the accessory structure or the house or the accessory structure. So a lot of District 1, which I think was number three in terms of licenses so far, um, it's zoned for R4, R5, which accept accessory structures, also ex uh, accessory, accessory dwelling units. And so I'm concerned that, um, you know, a lot of property um, in my district is being excluded you know, when this is something that we've been encouraging here for the last couple of years and, and asking people to, to get accessory dwelling units um, because they're zoned for it. And now we're saying that you won't be able to, you know, you have to make it a choice between, you know, putting a room in your house on, on an Airbnb or, you know, your accessory dwelling unit. So it just doesn't seem to be fair that this is something that we've been allowing, you know, for some time now. And we've got people that have invested hard money into a process that normally they can't even get lending for and it excludes them from being able to include this, you know, in the permit process. So I'll say that as something that I'm, I'm a little concerned about um, in, 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 the, in this proposed legislation as it's written now. And I think that, you know, we, that may be something that we need to look at um, if we move forward. My other question is around um, licenses, licenses and transfers. So, you know, if I buy a property, and, you know, or I get a license prior to this legislation and enforcement going into effect, I get a license, then I decide to sell my property. Now, most of the times I'm seeing this in my district being listed as investment um, income generating properties. Does that license leave if I sell that property or does that license stay with the property? The license goes with the licensee. 
So what if that licensee moves to a property that is already in an area that uh, has, um, you know, Airbnbs or, or short-term rentals within a 2,000 square foot buffer? Then they would be out of luck. Okay. So I see some, somewhat of an issue with that as well. It seems as if, in, in my opinion, that you know, there should be some type of process that allows the license to stay with the property um, if there's already a structure that has income generating possibilities on it as well. So we would need an amendment to the zoning ordinance for that, I think, but I will check on that. Okay. And then I, I know Council President kind of alluded to this, um, you know, this 45 day period of allowing people to get licenses. To me, it seems like we may have a period of basically people getting licenses and squatting on them. Um, so you'll have people that may not necessarily need to get a license that'll be getting licenses just to, you know, for the future of making sure that they had the opportunity to get one while we're grandfathering them in. And it just seems like that's going to be a major issue as well because, you know, we may have people that have an opportunity to be able, you know, be able to invest or, or generate income, you know, in a reasonable manner that are following the rules, that are doing the right thing, but will never have an opportunity to be able to participate in this. And so I think that's something that we, we need to look at in terms of, you know, is there some type of criteria we can put, you know, if there's an, an, an active property, if somebody just got a license and they don't necessarily need it and they're just squatting on it, I think that they should be excluded from being able to have a permit um, if that's something that they're not going to actively use. Okay, I've got that too. Uh, my other uh, question, and you and I spoke about this, Commissioner Prince, is about, you know, the possibility of maybe having event waivers. You know, Atlanta is known to host, you know, very large events. We have the World Cup coming. We've hosted many of Super Bowls. Um, we have other events that come that bring in, um, you know, a lot of people from outside of the city of Atlanta. And it seems like, you know, in the past, people have had the opportunity to list their properties, um, you know, in very short periods to be able to generate income. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to maybe have event waivers where people are within a 2,000 square foot buffer, but, you know, hotels are at capacity and there may be a situation where people want to be able to, you know, get an Airbnb or, or short-term rental in a community that is already saturated, you know, within the requirements that are listed. That is something we can certainly look at. I remember people doing that during the Olympics. And I'm also kind of a last thing, and this is just kind of a, a thought on my, on my end, is I wonder if this is something that could be regulated at the MPU level. Um, it just seems like, I, you know, just the council members that have already spoke to this already, you know, this seems like something that is, is very different by community, by community, by ge ge geography throughout the rest of, uh, throughout the entire city of Atlanta. And I wonder if having MPUs kind of in, in, involved in that process where you know, you could almost get a variance if it's approved by the community. If there's already, you know, so many licenses that have been permitted within a, in a, a zone, for instance, looking at the map that, you know, District 1 is pretty saturated already. So it seems like, you know, there's not a lot of new opportunities to be able to get a license because those, um, you know, there's not a lot of blue, I mean, there's not a lot of white within, you know, uh, space within the map that I'm looking at. So I'm just, you know, just wondering, you know, if that's something that we've we've looked into in allowing maybe neighborhoods or MPU neighborhood planning units to be able to, uh, you know, grant variances or waivers for people to be able to get permits. So because this ordinance that we have before you is a licensing ordinance, the only way it restricts where the short term rentals can go is just the distance separation. It addresses any place in the city where short-term rentals are allowed. And where short-term rentals are allowed, that's determined by the zoning ordinance. So what we would need to do then if we wanted to set up um, restrictions on location is we would need to do amendments to the zoning ordinance as a follow-up to the licensing ordinance. Understood. And, you know, I just want to kind of go back, I know a lot of this conversation started before many of us here were elected. And, you know, kind of getting back to the root cause of, of why we're having this conversation. 
Um, I think we've had some you know, unresponsible, you know, um, short-term rental owners that have caused a lot of issues throughout the city of Atlanta. We've had party houses that have been spread about, about, about around the entire city. And that's been one issue. The other issue that we, you know, we're talking about is our housing supply. You know, we've had outside investors that are coming in that are buying, you know, entire blocks of houses, you know, in certain communities and, and they're making them, you know, short-term rentals. And, and this has caused a lot of consternation in, co in communities. And I think this conversation needs to get back to that and figuring out how we regulate those situations, you know, and not penalize people that are really following the rules and doing the right thing and, and, and stopping them from being able to generate income, you know, for the model that short-term rental licenses were intended to do. And I think, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with Councilmember Norwood in trying to figure out, you know, do we bring people down here so that people aren't circumventing, you know, a lot of the rules so we can put a face to a name and really hold people accountable um, for breaking some of the rules uh, within the, the short-term rental, you know, requirements. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Um, moving on to Councilmember Amos. Yes, um, very quick questions. Um, just want to say thank you to um, Councilmember Lewis and Ashley Winston for saying a lot of things that I don't need to go back and say um, about the bad actors, about the shortage in housing supply, about the party houses. Um, this has been an issue that we've been dealing with for the last, at least a community in District 3 been dealing with for the last four or five years now. Um, it really concerns me that we are doing away with the primary resident um, clause. I understand the, um, I understand the clause that has, that came out of Louisiana, I believe it is, but I think we had a fix. It, it concerns me that we would change this in, um, the licensing process because it will have a direct ramification on a piece of paper I have dealing with the zoning. It will, it will hit that directly. So that's definitely something that we need to look at. And, and, and it's funny because we talk about things that um, we experience. And when I speak from experience, I speak from experience of actually living next door to a short-term rental property. So it's not nothing my constituents have to tell me. It's something I experience every day. But I, um, I definitely would like to see um, that single family, I mean that um, primary residence added back in there or something to protect neighborhoods. Um, since we have removed that, would the piece still be, I think at one point we was only allowing two licenses per holder. Would that clause still be in there? Or we eliminate that as well. No, sir, it wouldn't be in there. You said? It would not be in there. It would not be in so there. So every unit that you have would have to have its own separate license. Okay. And there's not a limit on the number of units you can have, except for the distance and the limits in the buildings. So the, the, the two questions we're going we're to have to figure out as a city together is which come first, the zoning or the license requirement. And then another thing we have never talked about in my that I haven't heard a serious conversation is and which we brought up today is enforcement, true enforcement. Uh, and when I say true enforcement, um, the, the software is good, very familiar with the software, um, but that's just knowledge based. I'm talking about boots on the ground to be able to go out and, and look at this short term run or catch these bad actors and play. And you will, you will see. Um, a paper out of my office that will look at the different fines and the license and things of that nature because What is this five hundred dollars? I think it was for a fine That's the cost of doing business in the city of Atlanta and if we cannot begin to change people's Character or change the way that they act in this city. We must find a way to do it and five hundred dollars is not it so um, You will be talking more definitely. Thank you. Okay, um, and I'm going to just um, take a moment to um, actually, President Shipman asked for another question because I know that I, we're, then after you, that'll be me, and then we'll uh, get on to public comment. Okay, thank you. So I just uh, want to I just want to go back to Councilmember Winston's good questions, just so I'm clear. I'm a license holder. I have a piece of property. I sell the property. 
The license follows me as a person. It does not stay with my property that I sold, correct? That's right, but where are you going with this and then, license? And then, and then I want to apply the license I hold to a new property I own. It's not grandfathered. So that new property, even if I've already owned it for a while and I'm trying to put the license on it, has to go through a new application process, correct? Yes. So in essence, the license doesn't follow me. The license just disappears. So I, I mean, I mean it, it effectively, right? When I sell the property, the license is gone. It, it, right. I, right? Okay. Sorry, right. that wasn't clear. No, no, no. That's why I'm asking just to, okay. So, the, so the, that's, that's clear there. Um, and then the rules for single family and the rules for multifamily, the, the definitions of single and multi for this legislation, to your point, are zoning regulations, correct? The single family is single family and duplex. Yep. That is the way the census defines single family. And then multifamily would be anything that's three units or more. Okay, so let's say that I have a duplex and an ADU on one piece of property, right? Mm -hmm. So that is considered a single family? Yes. Okay, and thus as a single family, um, I can have one of those three licensed, is that correct? Do you want to explain this, Greg? One property, a duplex, and an ADU. So the duplex, each one of those units can have their own license. If you have a side A and a B, the A side can be an STR, or the B side can be, I mean, and the B side can be an STR. They go in conjunction together with the ADU. So the ADU cannot have its own separate STR license, it's in conjunction with the main structure. So okay. you can't have for A, a STR license for the main unit and an STR license for the ADU unit. Okay, so just to, again, just to walk through for clarity, if I have a single family home and an ADU, either the single family home or the ADU can have an STR, but not both. Not, not both separate. You can rent out as an STR the entire property that main unit and the ADU under, under one license. And but I could rent, could I, but could I rent it out as, if I had a, let's just, again, I'm just trying to be specific on a case. If I had a duplex and an ADU, could I rent it out, could I list it as three different opportunities or could I list, could I not list it as three different opportunities? It's two. It's two. I could list the two parts of the duplex and or one part of the duplex and the ADU in that case. Or only one. the duplexes to or the ADU? Because it's Correct. more like a structure. Correct. Okay. Okay. So, so again, just to, if I had a single family and an ADU, I could do one or the other, or I could do them both as a whole, but it would be one license, one rent. I'm, somebody's coming in and renting that whole property. That's correct. If I had a duplex and an ADU, I could rent both sides of the duplex, right? Correct. Or the ADU. Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Shook. Uh, colleagues who uh, served with me on the last term are aware of my colorful views on the subject, and so I'll, I'll hopefully I won't have to reprise those, although I will if, uh, if I need to. Right now, I just got a couple process management questions. So, APD. Quote, APD is responsible for the enforcement of violations at STR units that have an active STR. Now, we're 400 cops short of the bare minimum of where we need to be. Um, have we, and you know what? No one's paying any attention up here as to who applauds the loudest. It's a distraction. Please show some respect. Have you talked to APD? How, on a scale of 1 to 10, how thrilled are they? about taking on this responsibility. Because, you know, we have people sitting around making 911 calls who have to wait forever for a, a police officer to show up. We have had conversations prior to the original ordinance when it was adopted. We continue to have engagement conversations with them. Yeah, I, you know, I can speak, I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but we can guess that they're not thrilled about it as well. I appreciate your candor. Um, is a violation, so three violations, three strikes and you're out, allegedly. Is a violation defined as a guilty verdict via a courtroom? 
or something lesser? It's, it's based on evidence of a, of a violation. Correct. Evidence of a violation. I don't, again, it, it, enforcement is going to be up on APD, and if they determine that based on the complaint, that person is in violation, then that is a, that's a violation. Well, I would think if I owned an STR and uh, I was a recipient of a citation, I would be able to argue, I would argue very vehemently that that falls short of a, a guilty verdict. Um, and so I don't know what constitutes a violation. Sounds like maybe y'all don't either. Um, I, I've had a problematic property um, a couple blocks from me, and they racked up a lot of citations. But that's as far as it went. And so I guess I'll look forward to getting some more information about that. In terms of um, your staff to process applications and review, you know, claims or evidence of, uh, you know, bad ownership, do you have the staffing to do that if this were enacted tomorrow? If it was enacted tomorrow? Yeah. We're adding 12 we, Yeah, we have uh, positions that are being added. So that would, that would essentially help us with that. We, at this present time, it's hard to gauge that based on the number of, based on what, what the new legislation will hold, as well as with the process with the software. But we're ramping up our staffing um, to be able to get, handle the influx that we expect. Okay, well, I mean, I'll, I'll close with this. I, you know, I'm just a constant worrier anytime we're adopting new regulations that I fear we can't efficiently and visibly enforce. Because then what we've shown to the public is the exact opposite of what we intended to show. And if we adopt all this with you know, stringent rules, but then it turns out, well, it, it's not worth the paper it's written on, that's, that's gonna be a problem. So I, I wanna hear more about the enforcement angle of this as the conversation continues, but thank you. Sure. Thank you. And right before I make my comments, we've heard a lot about uh, the law department and their stance, and I would love for the law department to weigh in while we're here today. Good afternoon, Amber A. Robinson, City of Atlanta, Department of Law. I did just want to um, clarify that, of course, um, through the process of um, the drafting of this um, proposed legislation, the law department was um, integral in providing advice and counsel in regards to that. However, um, insofar as there was any in, implication that you know the law department you know directed any kind of particular direction one way or the other, um, I would like to clarify that those, of course, would be policy decisions. Um, but in specific specifically in regards to the um, the distance requirements. Um, the law department has no opinion concerning the number or, or what the distance should be, um, though I can state publicly that we believe that a, a distance requirement of some sort is legally defensible. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Also, uh, legally, I'd like to actually clarify or for you to clarify that the city is not in a posture where the uh, primary residence at this time is not required or is required. Can you, because we've heard today that, we're, that it has been taken away and that's not actually correct. That, that's correct. Um, currently, there, is, there have been no adverse rulings uh, that affect the city of Atlanta concerning the application of such uh, primary residence requirement. There has been a case out of the Fifth Circuit, um, as I believe Councilmember Amos alluded to, um, from New Orleans, where the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals um, declared a similar requirement for a short-term rental ordinance to be unconstitutional. Uh, the City of Atlanta is not within the Fifth Circuit. We're in the Eleventh Circuit. That application, that ruling has no application here. Um, it's just a fact that that has occurred in the United States in a federal court, but it has not 
um, happened in our circuit and our ordinance has not been declared unconstitutional. Okay, and specifically, our ordinance that is ratified and on the books right now states that a primary residence is required. That's absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Because I know that a couple times today, they've said that since we no longer need that, and that is not where we are today with the legislation. Um, we've not ratified anything other than the fact that a primary residence is required. So. On to my question, um, just a couple because I do believe that that um, is important for us to hear from the public. Um, I am very concerned about page number 10 and that is where that Delta is, the, the, the huge gap in what's actually um, out in the universe as to how many uh, STRs we have in a city. Uh, that are available and how many we've actually captured. And uh, so I would want a dedicated group to be assigned to capturing all of the listed STRs in our city. Because when you don't, then we don't know, you know, exactly what we're talking about. From what I'm looking at, it looks like we're only capturing maybe 10 to 15% of exactly what is listed as uh, STRs in the universe. And um, that's a huge difference. That means we've got like 85% that's not captured uh, by the city. And you know, that's staggering. So I'd like to uh, correct that. I know we have uh, ways that we can do that and we could talk about that later. Um, but but I, I definitely think that we need to call attention to that. Um, and um, I also would like to know, and this is one of the Bakhtiari questions, but she had to leave. She wants to know um, if the third party that we are working with, um, if they're scraping data 24-7 to include Craigslist and the likes. Um, and if not, we need to make sure that that's happening as well. Yeah, we can ask that question definitely. I know that they stated they scrape over 70 some odd um, different websites. I don't know if that's one of them, but we would definitely find out. Let yeah, you know. I, I thought that was a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I know that public comment is what's holding. Uh, that's the only thing that's between us. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Chairman Dozier for public comment. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I uh, just want to just extend a word of gratitude uh, to our Department of City Planning team that came out today, put this presentation together, and asked some, some really difficult questions uh, from uh, myself and my colleagues. I just want to acknowledge that I know y'all are doing a lot of hard work for the city, and we're going to work to land this plan together. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the public. Uh, I know you all uh, have come with a lot of passion, uh, with a lot of insight, and we want to hear that. I know you've been hearing from us, we want to hear from you, uh, but I do want to establish a couple of ground rules before we start public comment. One, uh, as you have signed in, uh, each of you will have two minutes to speak. However, I know a few of you have yielded time to other speakers. Uh, there's a cap at 10 minutes, so I know in, at least in one or two of these cases, there's a situation where uh, that person was yielded more than 10 minutes, we're still going to cap it at 10 minutes. Uh, also recognize to that there's a few of y'all who have left, uh, there's a few of y'all who are probably going to leave after you uh, speak. I'm gonna read off every name as I go down. I know some of the folks that uh, yielded time is reflected on my notes. I'll acknowledge that that person had, had yielded time, but I just wanna make sure uh, that we go through the list so that I'm not missing anybody. Um, we also want to be as respectful as we can possibly be. I know there's a lot of uh, competing uh, visions, uh, there's some disagreements that we all may have. Uh, you know, we want to be respectful of the folks who are uh, speaking for public coming and addressing us. So uh, don't boo and jeer uh, and also be, uh, um, uh, you know, be respectful as you are clapping and, and, and uh, acknowledging your support of something that's being said. So I do have a mute button. And so uh, if you go over that two minutes, because we have a lot of people who are signed up for public comment, uh, we want to make sure we can hear from everyone. And so as you get to your two minute uh, uh, 
Uh, Mark, I will let you know that you're over time, and then we'll move to the next person. So uh, help me help you as we want to hear from you. I know many of you have emailed us. Many of you have called us and texted us. And so you are using all of your rights as constituents, as members of our community, and uh, as, as Americans to, to use your First Amendment rights to let us know what you think. But at this time, we want to put some guardrails in place so that we can hear from all of you. And so please work with us as we work through this public comment period. So uh, with that, uh, our first speaker is Zita Stanley Sartor. And I will also point out too, uh, uh, it's been a while since I've taken a class in cursive. And so many of y'all have, have beautiful handwriting, but if I misread or mispronounce your name, feel free to correct me at the microphone uh, because it's, it's been a while since I've uh, read handwritings. With that, uh, Ms. Hartoy, you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, council members. My name is Zita Stanley Sarter, and I live at the Landmark Condominiums, which is 200 living units, and they don't follow any directions, anything that's in any of this information. They do as they want to. Um, we do not want short-term rentals uh, grandfathered in in our building. The investors aren't doing anything, and they run the HOA board, but padding their pockets. They have no respect or regard for us as the residences who pay the freight all the time. They're destroying our property. They need a business license because that's what they're doing is running a business. They do not have hosts. They have no intentions of getting hosts. They let people check in any time, day and night, and they use our concierge that we pay for to do this. They don't keep up the property. It is nasty. They don't empty the trash, especially on the weekends. After Friday, they don't uh, emptied any, have it emptied anymore until Monday, and if it's a holiday on Monday, it's Tuesday. Don't, they don't respect this ordinance, and uh, they, they don't abide by the ordinance. That's what they need to do. And it is managed very poorly. And they have four, five, six, eight to ten people in a small bedroom of like 500 square feet, one, one bathroom, or 550 square feet one bathroom, but they'll have four, five, six, eight, or ten people in there at one time. What needs to happen is, like in other countries and other cities, we need to limit the number of days you can rent your Airbnb, especially at the landmark condominiums, 215 Piedmont. Now, I've been here before, and you all have heard me and heard my pleas, but this is ridiculous what goes on. They have no respect for us. They're trying to, what they're trying to do is because most of us who own our senior citizens. Thank you, Ms. Sarter. All right. Our next speaker is Dane Dino Butler. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I work for a um, property manager that operates on um, SERs, and uh, I've been doing that a little over a year. Um, I um, hear about bad goings on, uh, and of rumors of that nature, uh, that it gets down to just as we're all aware and we're sitting here wondering about the future, well, those guests simply aren't following the rules. Well, having said that with respect, um, no one is above the law. I'm not here to uh, remind us of what we're all obvious of, about, but no one's above the law or the rules that are designed to maintain peace, order, or the pursuit of harmony. Now, I'm a mere handyman of maintenance. And that is, you know, I'm given to repair uh, the very things uh, caused by um, human wear. And people, of course, they have to do things on a, on a basis of necessity. We get that. However, some behaviors are given to um, a lawful right of business to act accordingly. Now, when 
Those rules of business are disrespected and broken. We are to bring that grievance to light or to the law. We can't. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Laura Clemens, yielded her time to Kathy McClure. So our next speaker is Brenda Crawford. Brenda Crawford. And also I recognize that there, there might be a number of you who signed up and have no intention of speaking. That is perfectly fine. Uh, so if you don't want to speak as I call your name, just let me know and we'll continue to go down the list. Ms. Crawford, you have two minutes. My address is in East Point, but I get mail constantly saying that my address is Atlanta. I have one property in Atlanta and it is my grandparents' home. I did not purchase that house for an investment, I'm trying to maintain the home because it is uh, part of my family. I have tried for years to rent the property out. The last straw was my tenant set my house on fire. Um, now I decided to make it an Airbnb. Now my question is, since I get mail that says Atlanta, but I live in East Point, am I actually have a residence in Atlanta as a primary homeowner or is it East Point? So I'm confused. So I know that was a direct question. This is public comments for us to hear from, from you. I will ask you to, as you're done with your, your portion of public comment, you can sidebar and we can get you that answer. I know there's some ways to find that, but just wanted the context of this, your, your presentation is not necessarily to ask us directly, to let us know what you think of your concerns, but we'd be happy to get with you offline. Okay, thank you. All right, our next speaker is Kathy Bomer. And uh, after Kathy is Ted Freeman, so we'll start uh, letting folks know who's on deck. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kathy Bomer. I'm from the Home Park neighborhood. Uh, Commissioner Prince kind of kicked this off by stating that short-term rentals were a way to allow people to make money off homeowners, to make money off their homes to alleviate the cost of owning their homes. Well, my neighborhood, we have a proliferation of short-term rentals. Most of them are investment homes. To my way of thinking, if somebody's got the money to buy an investment home when they live outside the city of Atlanta or in another state, they are not having a problem paying for their home. Um, and, and to that end, I think th these need to be capped, whether it's a 2,000 foot limit or it's maybe so many per land lot. Home Park came up with an idea a couple years ago to limit it. We have four land lots in Home Park and limit it to two per land lot, which would give us eight short term rentals. I think eight mini hotels in our neighborhood is more than enough. We don't need 130 of them. Um, the city cannot enforce these. They can't enforce it at the zoning level and they can't enforce it at the police level, which is another reason why these have got to be capped. Um, I think you need to keep the primary residence uh, requirement because then at least you have somebody who's got skin in the game, who lives nearby, who's going to take care of these. These every, just about every short-term rental except one in my neighborhood is owned by investors who don't live anywhere near there. And when there's problems, nobody comes out to help us. So uh, we have way too many issues with that. Um, so I would ask that you look at limiting, uh, use a 2,000 foot rule or even a 1,500 feet, um, or do the land lot, do two per land lot. That's more than enough little hotels for our neighborhood. And we have been at this for four years. We've been begging for help. We're still at it. We're all volunteers. We came down, we all gave up work today to come down here once again. And it's, it should be, it should tell you just how bad this is for our neighborhood that we have to keep coming down here, going on five years now. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, and Ms. Bummer, my apologies. You actually have a total of four minutes. I forgot, I didn't read correctly. All right, thank you. All right, uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Tarrant Freeman and then Amy Pierce, you're on deck. Hey guys, I wanna say I appreciate you guys hanging out and listening to us. Um, I'm from Home Park also, and I've been trying to advocate for the, um, respectfully to all you guys here that are 
making some money out of, of short-term rentals, uh, I would advocate strongly that that should also be the case in a normal rental and in our tiny postage stamp sized uh, neighborhood, it's just not viable. There may be some places that have buffers between homes, but I can smell my, my neighbor's home is about from me to that chair and I can smell when they're cooking. I can smell when they change the baby's diapers. I'm a part of every um, event that they have and I know them and we're friends and it's, it's okay, you know? Um, but the home that's across the street from me, which is about from me to that flag, and I can see the whites in the eyes when the people are out there having their parties. We have had nothing but uh, chaos. And I had, uh, you know, I had a decent working relationship with the manager of that property. I, I appreciate him. I don't know if he's here, but um, it doesn't matter how well the property is managed. You can't prevent the person that is seeking. Have, have anybody seen the ads? Do whatever you want. Nobody is looking. It's a VRBO. Do you go there and you are not maintained. You're not, um, it, it's chaos. We've had multiple police calls to the, to the home across from us. Uh, and we've also, um, uh, it's been a terrible tragedy um, on me. I've owned my home for 25 years. Now we are a member of your parties. We're a member of, you know, it's like I live in a hotel. I have to meet new people every weekend. It's crazy. Um, it, and so now uh, there's a there's a four-story home that's next door to that home that is uh, the home directly behind that one is also an Airbnb. It's three stories and it advertised at 17 uh, capacity. Uh, we've had burnouts in front of our home, people car surfing. It's crazy. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, guys. All right, our next speaker is Amy Pierce, followed by Ben Gross. Hello, I'm Amy Pierce and I own a duplex in Old Fourth Ward. Um, I actually built the home myself. It was my dream home. I planned to live on top and then rent the bottom to help fund it um, in 2020. And then I also met the love of my life um, that same year. And he has a home in Decatur and a daughter who goes to school there. So I couldn't live in this beautiful dream home because I moved in with him to Decatur and now I rent both units, some of it in medium term rental and some in short term rental to supplement. The home was actually furnished for me to live there so I, it, it doesn't make sense to move all my furniture out and rent it kind of as a long term rental. So for the next five years while she's in school in Decatur, I'm not able to live in the home that I built for myself so short term rental is what works for me. I'm not interested in parties because the home is very nice. Um, so I, I am definitely in agreement that we need to control that and the property manager that I have is very serious about that. So just wanted to share my story. I'm not a resident of Atlanta, but I absolutely intend to be back as a resident of Atlanta once his daughter graduates from school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Our next speaker is Ben Gross. And Mr. Gross, you have 10 minutes due to yield at time. Uh, the Speak on deck is Timothy Jones. Thank you very much. Uh, council members, uh, council president, uh, people here today, thank you all for coming and, and sharing your stories and, and sharing about uh, your experience. I'm uh, thankfully and gratefully educated in uh, the beloved city. I did my undergrad here at Emory University, uh, left for about a decade, and then came back in 2020 with uh, an incredible opportunity to start a small business with my wife. In the last three years, uh, we've had the privilege of getting to employ people and to serve our great neighborhood. Last year, in 2022, we uh, paid uh, about $500,000 to vendors. These are people working in maintenance. These are people that are cleaners. These are people that are staging the units to look exactly like the photos. Uh, Councilmember Lewis, I greatly sympathize with, with your constituency who, who are working and unavailable to come and make public comment. And so I'd like to take an opportunity also to also speak for those people who are working today that don't have the opportunity. I have letters from a half a dozen vendors that we work with that are working, that have talked about the incredible impact that short-term rentals have had on them. Dear Ben, 
This is Jalila. I can't attend the working session today because I'm working, but please tell the committee that short-term rentals provide consistent work for me and my company. They help me grow my business in many, many ways. This amendment would impact my life drastically as a company and all my workers that depend on me to survive all of their monetary needs. Hello committee, my name is Maria Cruz. I've been working for Minty Living for around the last two years. For me, it has been an incredible blessing. To keep going and opening new paths of work for other people has been an incredible opportunity. And then lastly, and on and on. I, I mention this because uh, these issues that we hear about, these tremendous issues of bad actors, is something that we all believe in. We all believe in. Council Member Amos, you talked about your neighbor who was a bad actor, the gentleman who just came in and spoke about uh, the, the people doing wheelies on top of cars. None of us want this. We are your advocate here. We are an asset to you, and we all want the same thing. I'd like to take an opportunity, number one, to touch on some of the things that we do as professional operators. I think it's crucial to make a distinction here. Roughly one in five properties in Atlanta, which is a very small proportion, is managed by professional operators. We talk about these people slipping through the cracks. They're on VRBO and nobody's looking. We're looking. We're watching. We have ring cameras that provide us external views on every single one of our 140 properties. If anyone checks into a unit with more guests than they stated were going to be on the reservation, we proactively and preemptively let them know they are about to be kicked out of that reservation. We don't have parties, we don't want parties. Our challenge, our greatest challenge, is that if someone checks into our unit, and by the way, I brought some of the requirements that we perform to ensure that these are upstanding people checking into these units, checking their, their Facebook profiles, Amazon profiles, Instagram, Pinterest, ensuring this is a real person using a real identity, their IP address, the location at which they went to the website to fill in their identity verification. These are tremendous measures to try to prevent bad actors. But should we miss a bad actor? Should somebody come into the unit who has wrongful intentions? Guess what? We need to file eviction proceedings to try to get that person to leave. They don't need to pay another dollar in rent for us to remove them and extricate them from the property. They are treated as though they were a long-term renter with all the rights that a renter has. This is something that is completely unaddressed in the current ordinance. I, as an operator, have no capacity to remove a bad actor guest who had the malice of intentions, but in a hotel, somebody cannot be wearing shoes and the hotel doesn't like it, they can literally have them removed. But guess what? I pay the exact same taxes as a hotel. In 2023, I estimate $50 million will be paid to Atlanta in sales tax, hospitality tax, and state hotel motel fee. I want to again point out that we are your assets. Um, President Shipman, you asked about some of the data that you saw and its accuracy. What is clear here from this map, this is not the number of listings inside of Atlanta. What they have done is taken highly available websites like AirDNA, said, oh, AirDNA says this is in Atlanta, it's therefore in Atlanta. This is not accurate. This is about a 20% overstatement. If we redraw, accurate county lines, this is closer to 7,000. But it requires an expert in this industry to understand that level of nuance. It requires an expert in this industry to understand that we are not providing professionals the, the opportunity to truly advocate for neighborhoods. 
Neighborhoods are so important to us. Again, I came down here with my wife. We live in Inman Park. We're sponsoring the Inman Park Festival this year. We are in close communication with every neighbor of any unit that Minty Living manages. They have our number. They know we want to be contacted immediately. That's how we get ahead of enforcement. That's how we get ahead of bad actors. That's how we get ahead of these party houses. It's not by trying to, to create sweep, sweeping legislation in an attempt to regulate, but rather partnering with the providers that are true assets to this industry. The last piece that I'll mention before I go is some suggested changes that I have around the legislation. Number one, because I think that's very important. This isn't just a forum to speak about the ways and the impacts that we make, but rather concrete pieces that we need to adopt and change. So very quickly, number one, I think this piece about the bad actors that are guests, there needs to be an, a capacity inside of this ordinance to have the bad actors that are guests be held accountable as well. If you're looking for legislation that's been done, the United Kingdom has implemented legislation in the last month that specifically addresses this issue, happily would send that on. Number two is this element of conveyance of a license. We talk about usage. We're talking about residential versus a number of units. That is a usage conversation, and yet a license cannot be conveyed to a purchaser. There is a value to that license, and we need to be provided the assurances of conveyance inside of, uh, inside of this bill. Lastly, I do want to take an opportunity to address some of these concerns. I hear about Landmark, and I deeply sympathize with that as an operator that would not stand for this type of behavior. We can take buildings and remove the licenses of entire buildings. That's the solution to this. If you say, okay, great, there are bad actors inside of this building, inside of this building, there have been three strikes over the last month, the building's licenses are now pulled. You've now created an incentive for people to collaborate and get along instead of argue and it's this is mine versus yours. Let's try to approach this in ways that again takes advantage of the fact that we all want the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gross. So I will just say for the public record, before we go on to Mr. Jones, just want to just state for the public record, uh, Mateo Bradford Vasquez yielded to Mr. Gross, uh, Samantha Brazejas yielded to Mr. Gross, uh, Sam Hayes, Maya Spencer all yielded to Mr. Gross, and then Anthony Williams yielded to Kathy McClure. That takes us to Mr. Timothy Jones and uh, Randall Lanson, Lanson, you're on deck, and then you will, I'm sure, correct me on the pronunciation of your name. Mr. Jones. All right, I don't see Mr. Jones, so that takes us to Mr. Randall. Hi, my name is Randall Lotzenheiser. Uh, I live in Midtown. I've operated an SCR for about five years. It's worth Airbnb. Um, I am an owner occupant, and um, I think the 2,000 foot requirement is totally arbitrary. Um, being in Midtown, and especially as applies to Midtown, I live in a single family residence. The properties on both sides of me are four unit residences. So um, I'm at 10th Street. If we apply that 2,000 foot rule, the next residence that can be, the next single family residence that can be an Airbnb or an STR is at 4th Street. That's six blocks away. That's just, for a, for a neighborhood like Midtown, that's too far of a distance, especially when you take into account that the buildings on both sides of me both have four units, so each one of those can have an Airbnb or an STR in it and not have to meet the 2,000-foot requirement. Um, I think that the owner-occupant is, uh, or the city-occupant, I think owner-occupant is a, is a very good requirement because um, of all the bad stories I've heard about any STR, none of them have ever happened where there was an owner present at the property. They've all been where there was an absentee owner or no owner was to be found or a man no manager was to be found. I love Councilmember Norwood's uh, requirement that each operator appear at the city. I've heard instances of 
uh, people buying apartment buildings, small apartment buildings of 10 to 15 units, creating a separate LLC for each unit in the building, and then they can, then that is a one unit, that's one license per unit because each unit is owned by an LLC. Um, so I have very brief to the point. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Shelley Dean, and then after that, Lakeisha Knight, you're on deck. I live five homes from the city line, so I can't get a license. I have been in the Airbnb business for five years, and it's my main source of income. I employ a cleaning company, a manager, and maintenance. My guests are traditionally business people. Right now, I have a man from New York whose father is in ICU at Emory. I have over 1,600 reviews and maintain close to a five-star rating. I have made a commitment to my neighbors to make sure there are no parties and the number of people entering are limited. My secret is I do this by asking my guests to agree to my rules or they can immediately cancel their bookings without penalty if my rules do not fit their agenda. I explain that without this agreement, I cannot stay in business and I explain the penalty for breaking the rules. <coughs> it works. I would say I get three to four cancellations a month once they are asked to agree to my rules. And um, knock on wood, I have never had a problem. I actually feel like I won something every time they read my rules and don't respond back and cancel. It's my experience, good management is the key to a successful experience for you and your neighbors. I was pretty surprised hearing some horror stories at the last city council meeting, and it was so obvious it was the result of poor management. I hope to be able to continue what I have built for five years and depend on. I hope the council will consider grandfather rights and allow me to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lakeisha Knight, followed by Daniel Jasmine. Danielle Jasmine, sorry. Good afternoon, I am Lakeisha Knight. I'm also a local realtor here in the city of Atlanta and I also manage Airbnb properties uh, of my personal as well as properties of my clients. So just hearing all of the proposed changes and knowing what currently is in legislation for the short-term rental licenses, these are just a few of the changes I'm asking that they seriously consider. Um, the elimination of the primary residence requirement. A lot of my clients are out of state. This is a business for them. And I do agree that there needs to be some type of parameters put around guidelines for licenses, but I don't think a primary residence necessary, necessarily being in place is the right uh, measure for that. I mean, if you have a proper management company in place and you're following the rules, I don't think you should be penalized with that. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, hold on. Here. Okay. And um, allowing the STR to be in the primary home as well as the ADU. I have clients that have built ADUs at their home and they spent good money to build those. Those start at a prime rate of about $60,000 to build. And to say that they can't have short term rental in their home as well as the ADU is just it's just not fair and it's a waste of their money at this point. Um, I also think the elimination of the two property maximum uh, would definitely be fair because I have clients that own five or six Airbnbs or short-term rentals. Is Why should they be limited to only to be able to have two of them? Um, finally, the, uh, the elimination of the 2,000 foot rule with the density of the city of Atlanta, I just think that's gonna be really uh, impossible to like enforce when we have Airbnbs that are in same buildings or same blocks. I just think that's really unfair. And lastly, I think the license transfer should definitely be able to stay with the property when a residence moves. Thank you. Our next is Danielle Jasmine, followed by Jeff Lee. Uh, 
Hello, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank um, the council members for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my husband. Um, we uh, live here, we work here, and we invest here in Atlanta. Um, we are good apples. Um, we've been running our short-term rental management business um, with properties that we have uh, bought, rehabbed, and now rent out. I'm a licensed GC in Atlanta. Um, um, we take these dilapidated properties, we rebuild them, and then we choose to rent them as short-term rentals. Um, throughout this process, we actually employ a team of people, including what's been um, spoken about before, cleaners, laundry, uh, manager, handyman, landscapers, pest control, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of them rely on um, the wages that they earn from these properties. Uh, uh, we are good apples in that we are also in agreement that the bad apples should be uh, sought out and removed um, from allowing them to actually run short-term rentals. The ways in which we operate our several homes, um, which we have over 2,000 positive reviews for as super hosts in the city of Atlanta, um, excellent relationships with all of our neighbors because we make that effort. We believe in these communities so we know our neighbors and work with them in all capacities. Um, but the ways in which we actually operate are by strict filtering processes and criteria. We have not had one party on all of our thousands of reservations that we have had in our homes. Uh, that's because we also have that uh, filtering criteria of rules that need to be agreed upon for all guests prior to staying in one of our homes, uh, security cameras as well. Um, uh, the majority of our guests are actually visiting um, Atlanta, uh, patronizing these uh, neighborhoods, which are the reasons why we fell in love with Atlanta. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thank Jasmine. You. All right, our next speaker is Jeff Lee, followed by Stephen Jones. I think that might be me. My, my handwriting is bad, I'm sorry. <coughs> if you just state your name for the public, and then. Um, Jeff Cox. Oh. Yes, thank looks you. like Lee, sorry. Um, so yeah, I've got two minutes. First of all, um, I appreciate the council members that have stuck around to hear the, the public opinion. Um, so I moved to Atlanta in 1995, and I'm, while I'm not a native, I feel like if you're pre-Olympics here, you're, you know, it's close enough, close as you're gonna get in Atlanta. And it's been nothing short of amazing and a privilege to see the growth that's taken place in this city. And I look forward to what this, the next seven to 10 years also brings uh, to Atlanta. I think that there's a, uh, not too many parties in this room that would agree with me when I say we have a massive uh, affordable housing issue going on right now in our city today. And it's disappointing to stand here and come here today and hear that uh, we're potentially taking an option, an opportunity off the table that allows those to live amongst the communities they serve. That's a, that's a citywide issue. Um, for those council members who are for the ordinance, I respect you and your position, but I have an ask and I have a little homework for you to do. Um, what zoning laws that we have today are you willing to alter or revise to help bring more affordable housing options to this great city that we desperately need today? Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, next is Stephen Jones, uh, and then um, Rich Monroe, you're on deck. Hello, it's been enjoyable listening to everyone debate this uh, issue. Uh, I <clears throat> was born in Atlanta, I grew up in Atlanta, um, I now live in Tucker. I own long-term rentals and short-term rentals in Chambly and in unincorporated DeKalb. And like many others, I run them professionally uh, using rules and regulations to make sure there are no parties, no disturbances uh, for the neighbors around our properties. It seems to me the city has two problems, party houses and erosion of long-term rental inventory. And I want you, you to imagine for a second that being a doctor is a new thing. And the city is approaching regulating doctors through a 2,000 foot barrier. And with that, no one would know if you're dealing with a good doctor or a bad doctor. It does nothing to, to address the actual skill of being a doctor. And short-term rentals are very much the same. It's a complex business uh, that can be handled by professional certification. And a bar that is high enough that the bad actors can't put up the work or money necessary to get into the business. And I also like um, uh, Mr. Winston's suggestion that we allow the MPUs to control uh, the mix of long-term to short-term rental housing in their districts. Um, look, the bottom line is that uh, short-term rentals 
uh, introduce a lot of travelers to parts of the city they would not normally see, bringing money to small corner businesses within those neighborhoods that need it. Um, and it allows new owners to defray the cost, the increasingly high cost of owning a home in the city of Atlanta. It allows legacy owners to rent, to make money from their properties, allowing them to stay in the houses as well. There's so many benefits to short-term rentals. I urge the council to go back to the drawing board, seek professional guidance from all the stakeholders, and readdress this ordinance from the ground up. Right. Uh, Councilmember Noah had a, a quick yeah. question that I wanted to get um, I, Before you leave, and um, Danielle is still here, and I went out into the hallway to find Shelley. All of y'all who, all three of y'all have mentioned rules. We'd like a copy of that. We'd like to know what it is you require. Uh, just as a guideline for us, if we're going to come up with a certification and we're going to try to make your lives easier and the bad actors gone, it will be very helpful for us just to see what your recommendations are. Thank you. And anyone else who has something. It's, it's no small thing to run an STR, let me tell you. It's not passive income. It is very much an active right. business. Thank you. All right, up next is uh, Rich Monroe, and just want to acknowledge for the public, uh, Marva Moon Rose uh, yielded to Katie McClure, so I just wanted to be clear about that. Rich Monroe, you have four minutes to the yield of time. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, thank you, Council Members, for allowing us to speak publicly about this event. Uh, my name is Rich Monroe. I am the president of Amstra, and I wanted to, uh, you know, echo a lot of what the folks have said about uh, regulating bad apples. Uh, one of the things that we would like to do as a, a nonprofit association is help the community and all of the hosts develop best practices. Uh, some of the things that uh, Council Member Norwood is asking for is something that we'd like to educate uh, all hosts that will get licensed and work very closely with the city council and with city planning uh, to make sure that we uh, are all adhering to those same best practices. Uh, to give you some specific examples, some of which have already been mentioned, uh, you know, we require guests to actually not only provide their information, but if you're traveling with other folks that are going to be there that you're going to be responsible for, then we need the contact information for those other individuals. So there's additional steps that we take. Uh, to make sure that we provide those ground rules, those house rules, uh, that we want to make as uh, specific standards for, all, for us all to adhere to, to be very uh, consistent with the priority of making sure that the neighborhoods are not uh, disturbed. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, can also be instituted is require uh, a total vetting of uh, requiring not only a driver's license and an identification to confirm those folks that are coming, uh, but to actually require that uh, with a selfie to make sure that that, that ID is not stolen. Um, so we take extra steps and we provide these specific guidelines. Not only are we saying, okay, you agree to come and stay here, but there's no parties and no events, but you are also not allowed to have any outside guests other than the folks that are coming to that property that we have approved for the total number that should be in accordance with the number of people that can sleep in that property. And so we are taking very you know, specific steps to make sure that we adhere to that. Uh, we use noise detection devices that measures the level of sound. Uh, we make them sign uh, to agree that there is a quiet time in those neighborhoods from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, if there's any noise, I'm not waiting for a neighbor to call. We are being very proactive. We use this technology to notify us to make sure that we're reaching out to them. If it's a loud disturbance at 2 o'clock in the morning, um, that level of noise should not exceed a certain decibel count. And if it does, we are reaching out to that guest. Uh, we also have um, security service. Um, I'm, I'm not you know, definitely we call the police if there's an issue, but we would prefer to have a security service. If they have, uh, they've agreed that if they're staying there, they're adhering to those rules. If they do not and they disobey those rules, we will have them physically removed from the property. Um, people have talked about uh, homeowners that are not nearby uh, the residents. Professional managers employ security service folks for that very reason, to make sure we can self-police and enforce when these issues are occurring. Uh, we've all talked about the, the agreement that we don't want these parties occurring. We do not want events. That's kind of the very first thing that we tell people that come to stay with us, that that's not allowed. It's, it's prohibited. And it's, it's zero tolerance. Um, if, the, if something is, is going on uh, with the outdoor surveillance or with the noise ordinances, we will have those folks removed. And so with Amstro, we want to make sure that we develop these standard best practices. We're happy to share uh, uh, with Councilmember Norwood and others what those guidelines are and so that we can be consistent and kind of 
work together uh, to, for this uh, ordinance to be successful. Uh, one of the things that hasn't been addressed yet, but uh, some of my other colleagues will be talking about, uh, rather than a buffer, which a lot of your council members have already admitted is going to be very difficult to enforce, uh, we would like to recommend instituting more of a global cap on the city. Uh, there's other major cities that have done that. It's a lot easier to enforce, a lot easier to understand uh, without having to, under, you know, kind of draw a line from one property to the next. Um, so if we can come up with a global cap that makes sense for all of us, that kind of puts a uh, percentage on the entire city as far as no more than X percent uh, of short-term rentals in the city, I think that will solve the issue. It will also make enforcement much easier uh, to adhere to. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Elise Yuan, and then Dong Dong Fang, you're on deck. Elise Yuan? If you don't want to speak, you don't have to. Just want to clarify that as well. Hi, I'm talking this behalf of me and then uh, don't know my business partner. Uh, we have been investing in Atlanta. We buy um, bad houses and then um, banded houses, change them into a nice looking houses. And uh, we are very responsible host and we're not definitely not the bad apples. I think the city of Atlanta should put the rules to get rid of bad apples and keep the good apples like us. <laughs> and also we have cameras inside the house because we don't do the whole house. And the whole house rental caused a lot of troubles for us and for neighbors, so we decided not to do that whole house listing. So we're really tight on the cameras, watching people um, in and out, and then uh, make sure people follow the rules with quiet hours. And also, we, because we own the property, we have really good relationships with all the neighbors. And they have my phone number. If anything happens, they can call me anytime, doesn't matter how late. And also, we have, uh, I have hired a security guard. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm kind of a little nervous. So, so, so anytime if people have a party, and I'll send a security guard over and ask them to leave. So we're really, really tight on our every single reservation and with, with a, uh, Airbnb. Uh, so we definitely good apples. And we keep our property really nice outside and inside and it really change the neighborhood. So I think we're doing good thing for the city of land. Thank you. Thank you. And just so, so we're clear, Ms. Fong, you're not planning on speaking, is that correct? All right, thank you. All right, next, uh, Ryan Toth. And Kathy McClure, you're on deck. Excuse me, Council President. I wasn't on the list, but can I speak? No, if you didn't sign up, unfortunately. Oh, okay. The sign-ups were at the beginning. We actually delayed the meeting about 20 minutes to allow for sign-ups. So my apologies, but if you're not on the list, we're going to keep pressing forward. All right, thank you. All right. Mr. Toth? All right, that takes to Kathy McClure. Mr. McClure, you have 10 minutes due to yield of time. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Kathy McClure. I'm an attorney. I'm also the vice president of Amstra, the Atlanta Metro Short-Term Rental Alliance. We are an all-volunteer organization we are a nonprofit and we represent the interest of short term rental owners, property managers, and hosts. Our organization recognizes the need for reasonable regulation of short term rentals to ensure that our guests are respectful of their neighbors and abide by all applicable laws. Here we are, just a year, over a year since the current short term rental ordinance became effective. Yet this ordinance has never been enforced because of legal issues that have plagued it from day one. I would also add that there were many administrative stumbles, including a burdensome and complicated application process that confused and overwhelmed the applicant pool. We now have a second chance to pass an ordinance that works for the city of Atlanta and treats the short-term rental community fairly. It is vital that we get it right this time. To avoid repeating this history, it is imperative that the revised ordinance be reasonable, that it be measured to address the problem that it intends to solve. It should also be easy to understand and easy to enforce. 
and finally, it must comport with the law. We believe the proposed revision put forth by the Department of City Planning fails in all of these measures. The foundation for the legislation is a 2,000-foot buffer between single-family and two-family residences. From our research across the country, a buffer of nearly a half a mile is unheard of in short-term rental regulation across the country. Bear in mind that this is a 2,000 feet in every direction. The result is a zone of nearly a square mile where only one short-term rental would be allowed. A 2,000 foot buffer is excessive and unjustified. It would result in a fraction of current short-term rentals receiving licenses, thus dramatically impacting the city's ability to provide adequate housing for the film industry, visitors attending large-scale events like the Democratic National Convention that we hope to land, and families and thousands of other visitors who prefer staying in a home rather than a hotel. Most damaging and da excuse me, most damning is the fact that a 2,000-foot buffer between short-term rentals would be an absolute nightmare to implement. A buffer would set off a race to obtain a license. One can envision multiple license applications being submitted for one license in a given area. Staff would be let, left to decide who gets the coveted license. How would they do that? With a high school compass and a 2,000 foot measuring tape? Or perhaps more likely is that an algorithm would, would uh, decide who gets the license. Would, will the public accept that explanation? The level of confusion that will inevitably result will lead to multiple appeals and, yes, litigation. The last thing we need is another failed effort because the method of regulation is not understandable for the public and cannot be easily enforced. Finally, this legislation does not comport with the law because grandfather rights are not protected. This 45-day window is a gimmick. It is not a guarantee of any rights that typically flow with, a sh with uh, grandfather rights. So we, have a, we believe there's a better way to achieve our, fared obje our, our shared objective. In a large city like Atlanta, with 242 unique neighborhoods, few of them having square city blocks, buffers are not the best regulatory option. We believe a percentage cap system is the better solution for Atlanta. A percentage cap based on the total number of dwelling units in the city would be simpler and far easier for the staff to manage and the public to understand. Percentage, excuse me, percentage caps would also have the benefit of offering precise control over the number of short-term rental licenses issued. Here are the fundamentals of our proposal. Short-term rentals would be limited to a global cap of a specified percent of the total number of dwelling units in the city of Atlanta. Single family, two family, tries, and quads would be subject to the global cap. Multifamily buildings would, be, uh, would have building caps in two categories from five to 12 units, and 13 or more units would be subject, also be subject to multifamily building caps and the global cap. We propose, we also propose creating license categories for owner occupied and uh, owner occupied and oper operator occupied units as has been done in other cities. These units are in relatively small numbers and they are there deserving of their own license category because owners and operators who reside on site depend on the rental income to pay their mortgage and per one study out of Georgia State, the income they receive reduces the likelihood of foreclosure for those properties. 
These units do not impact available housing stock, and historically, few neighbor complaints arise from these properties because the owner or operator is on site to manage the guest behavior. In our view, owner-occupied and operator-occupied units would not be counted in the global cap. There's a small number of them anyway, and they would be the only license category that would not be included in the global cap. Finally, grandfathering. Uh, under our plan, there should be a separate license category for uh, units entitled to grandfathering. Lice, uh, legacy properties uh, would be counted under the global cap, but a property could not be denied a license because it does not meet the global cap or the multifamily uh, building caps. The owner of a legacy property would be entitled to a renewal of the legacy license so long as the license is in good standing and the owner has not discontinued renting the property short term for a continuous period of 12 months. The purchaser of a legacy property would be entitled to issuance of a license upon on notice that of the property transfer to the Department of Planning. This is because under the law, the right to continue to rent the property as a short-term rental legally runs with the land. To ensure that, our, uh, that owners of legacy properties have sufficient notice of the need to file and apply for a legacy license, we've also proposed that owners and long-term tenants of legacy properties be afforded a 180-day period to file to submit an application. Finally, we suggest, strongly suggest, that the legislation that this council decides upon must spell out how the licensing process would be implemented because it did not go well last time. Thoughtful consideration and adequate direction are needed to avoid another botched administrative process. These are the broad outlines of our proposal. We look forward to working with you and the full council to achieve an effective, efficient, and fair short-term rental ordinance. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Amy Barnes with Moira Keller on deck. Amy Barnes. Amy Barnes. Did you Yes, Amy Barnes. Yes, sorry. No, no, I, no, my apologies. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm mostly deaf, so pardon my deaf voice. Um, I don't think anybody here has ever understood what it means to have a hand go across your face. I don't think anyone here has had to find shelter with an hour of notice. I, I have been a victim of domestic violence. I have been that person needing to seek shelter literally at 11 o'clock at night within the hour. Um, please don't take my safety net. Please don't restrict the houses that people who suffer can choose from. This is our only opportunity. I, I, I have three friends who are now going to have to seek shelter within two months because their leases are out. I know other people who have had to exit bad relationships with children in tow. Please do not take our safety net. These restrictions will only result in, in, in taking away from the market, the only staff job that we have. If you need an apartment, if you need a place to go to now, short-term rental is our only option. The shelters are full. If you're homeless and you're working, there is no shelter. There is nowhere. Please don't take our safety net. Please, we need the market to be open and unrestricted. We need help. 
We need less restriction. We need not this rigmarole. All this does is reduce the housing stock that desperate people need. Drop your restrictions on the square footage. Make it easy. Don't take our housing. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Maura Keller with Ken Crafton on deck. Good afternoon. Um, just briefly, my husband and I own a rental house which is right next door to us in Inman Park, which is managed by Minty Living, um, an excellent company that has allowed our experience as landlords to work very well. It's a much appreciated supplement to our income as we are both retired. We've lived in Inman Park for decades. We're devoted to the neighborhood and uh, to the neighborhood piece as well. We would never tolerate loud parties. Um, it's, it just, uh, I don't think it would happen and, and we would work with our property management company um, against that if, if that situation ever arose. I just urge you in the amended ordinance to clarify just how short-term rentals are a property right for us property owners. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ken Crafton, followed by David Adon. Thank you, council members. My name is Ken Crafton. My wife and I have been short-term rental owners at the Landmark Condominium since 2018. We lived there ourselves for several months before moving to Costa Rica, so I know what it's like to actually live there in person. Um, we moved to Costa Rica for work we use the income generated from the short-term rentals to supplement our income. And I've been fortunate to welcome guests from all over the world and be their first impression of our beautiful city. And I do not take this responsibility lightly. Many of our guests come to Atlanta for the first time. They want someone that can give them recommendations on where to visit, what to eat, activities for their family. And they also like that we provide full kitchens and living space. They can cook their own meals if they have dietary restrictions. Most guests are polite, clean, well-behaved, law-abiding citizens, and have no parties. I would say 99% fall into this category. Of course, they're guests that are not this way. Long-term tenants in our community create the most significant challenge with loud music, smoking marijuana, not obeying the association rules, and often community members don't realize the difference. They see the problem and they assume it's a short-term rental guest. Um, we provide alternative standards that attract additional business and leisure travelers, even state representatives. We're in a building where short-term rentals are common and limiting them to 15% cap would cause significant hardship to a lot of owners in our building, including my family, who use the additional income to support our two kids, and it would cause a fire sale and the property values would plummet. We live in the city of Atlanta and all the additional income is returned to our community. Condo owners and community boards have always determined rental limits and caps, and we ask that you um, allow the number of short-term rentals in a condominium to be left to the discretion of that com condominium community. Thank you for the time and Thank you. considering my thoughts. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is David Adan, followed by Arthur Modell. If, if it mispronounced, if it's Aiden, I apologize. David Adon, David Aiden. All right, Arthur Modell. Arthur Modell. Elizabeth Richmond. All right, and after Elizabeth Richmond, we have Talia Bunting. Firstly, thank you to the few of you that are remaining for giving us, the public, our chance to let you know and express how this ordinance would affect us as a whole community. My name is Elizabeth Richmond. I'm the secretary for the Atlanta Metro Short-Term Rental Alliance, or AMSTRA, as we've heard. I'm a former teacher and a small business owner. I'll start by saying that I do not own any investment properties in Atlanta, despite how AMSTRA was described by the city planning department. Yet this ordinance would be detrimental to my life as I know it. For the last decade, I've taught seventh grade science while supplementing my income 
using Airbnb to rent out the spare rooms in my personal home like a roommate. I now rent my basement apartment in my current home with my husband, so I'm especially passionate about on-site operators and people that use Airbnb or short-term rentals as a way to afford a mortgage. During COVID, I left the classroom to pursue my dream job and started managing other people's short-term rental properties. Like the other managers that we've heard, being so passionate about it, I have poured my heart into this. I don't have many issues at my properties because of the fail-safes that I put into place and because of the amount of love and attention that I give every single unit that I manage. My husband quickly followed his, uh, or left his nine to five to follow me. He's now the handyman that the two of us depend on this short-term rental ordinance to be accessible to people like ourselves. For the last few moments, I have a few recommendations. Firstly, an owner-occupied exemption for people like myself that couldn't afford a mortgage at 18 except for the fact that Airbnb existed. Allowing police to remove these bad apples for our neighbors and thank, for you, a thank, company called Superhog does background checks automatically thank, for you. Thank you, Ms. Richmond. Your time has expired. Next speaker is Talia Bunting. Talia Bunting. All right. May uh, Iyer, my apologies if I mispronounce your name, please correct me. Hey everyone, my name is Meha. I am a licensed realtor in Atlanta, and I also work for a female owned and run SDR property management company here in Atlanta. So I'm gonna keep this short and sweet, but I just wanted to point it out that, you know, Atlanta is a vibrant community with people visiting and c contributing to our city for a variety of reasons. We have people coming in for um, conferences, conventions, for the film industry, for so many different reasons. And for every horror story that you hear about um, short-term rental guests, there are also families here visiting um, other family in town. We have business travelers here for conventions. Um, and a lot of our guests actually end up being City of Atlanta residents who are out of a home for whatever reason, whether the power went out that night or they're out of their home for a week. So for every horror story that, every horror story that you hear, we're also having plenty of success stories with it. Um, my main question is, how would the distance requirement weed out your bad apple hosts? I think that if we consider doing regulations based on how these rentals are managed with all the, the fail-safes that previous people have mentioned versus where they're being managed, that would be a more effective way to make sure that the hosts who are being responsible and doing a good job of hosting and like showing people how Atlanta hosts visitors, I think that would be a better way to regulate. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next two speakers, Jennifer Brooks. Jennifer Brooks, all right. Uh, Michael Harvey. And Michael, you'll have eight minutes due to yield of time. So uh, my name is Michael Harvey. Uh, I'm a resident of Ormwood Park. Uh, I've been in Jason Districts, uh, Jason, uh, Jason Winston's district, and uh, formerly Carla's district since about 2016. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about in the uh, the short-term rental commission uh, that we had some wonderful help from uh, Mr. Pace on is why are we having issues in some districts but not others. Uh, in our district, we just really don't have those problems anymore, and there really isn't anything special about District 1. Um, we, whenever there's been a problem, we have tried to get the property managers, the owners, and the neighbors to come together to figure out, you know, what's, you know, what's a solution that works for everybody. And I just really haven't seen that many issues throughout the city of Atlanta where we, once we got the owners, property managers, and the neighbors together that we weren't able to find a solution. Um, 
one of the best parts about you know our original piece of legislation that is law right now is we require in order to get a license we have to have a property manager and you know once we get that property manager in place you know the buck stops with them having a phone number and a person to uh, uh, that is going to be in charge when there's a problem that's going to solve a lot of our problems uh, miss Norwood had a fantastic suggestion about having folks uh, uh, come down to City Hall to get their license you know making people put a you know show up and you know have a, a face to a name that's going to solve a lot of our problems uh, one of, uh, I, you know, we're going to have to get some software in place to uh, to regulate this uh, this whole, whatever scheme we end up with. But uh, I looked at that ten thousand number, and that's not a great number. Uh, I spent uh, you know about ten years being an auditor, and uh, you know we need to make sure that we're using good data when we're making laws. And that ten thousand number is that's coming from somebody who's trying to sell us some software. Uh, Amstra, we've spent the money to, you know, to look at the data. Uh, we have several, you know, data scientists that are involved in Amstra. And if we do decide to move from a distance-based requirement to a, uh, let's say, you know, the cap that Kathy suggested, we need to make sure that the data that we're looking at is accurate. Right now, there's no barriers to entry to creating an Airbnb listing. So if four or five years ago, uh, you decided on a whim to spend the five minutes to make an Airbnb listing, that number is going to be included in that numerator. So if we do decide to take a look at something like CAPS, uh, we definitely need to spend some time to make sure that you know the data that we're looking at to make these decisions is accurate. Um, uh, I really want to, uh, to thank uh, Mr. Pace and, uh, and Alyssa. They've had an almost impossible task the past year to get people in compliance and to you know, get us to a place where we have over a thousand licenses. That is, uh, uh, you know, that is not an easy accomplishment. Uh, you know, when I served on the commission, uh, uh, Gregory Pace did a fantastic job listening to some of our questions. Uh, you know, he was willing to, you know, make some improvements, and uh, I think we got a lot done. And I think that, you know, thousand plus number that, you know, speaks to what happens when we get all the stakeholders in a room. Uh, the commission was uh, disbanded uh, at the end of the year last year, and I think that was a mistake. The, part of the reason we're in the position right now is the stakeholders, you know, haven't been in the room. We've been, you know, make, making our lawmaking decisions based on, you know, what works in other cities. New Orleans is not Atlanta. We're unique and we need to come up with a unique solution. And I think, you know, getting out all the stakeholders, the folks from Amstra, the folks from Home Park, the folks from Landmark, getting everybody in a room to get their feedback, that's going to play an integral part in, you know, finding a solution that's going to work for everybody. Um, I have a couple minutes uh, left over. Um, I've been a property manager for, I guess, six, seven years. Uh, and I've seen every single problem that exists. Um, we use the, the host community to come up with, you know, what are the best practices of like, why, why are we able to not have problems in the homes that we manage, but there are issues in other neighborhoods with other, other folks. Uh, I, I know I'm you know, kind of repeating myself here, but uh, you know, just getting that feedback is, is really, really important. Um, do you guys have any questions for me while I'm up here? If if we do, we can sidebar with you. I know a lot of us have your content information. But cool. Well, it's you have to a, take it here. I didn't think I would have this much time, but uh, <laughs> thanks for listening and uh, really appreciate all your work. All right. Thank you. All right. Next speaker is Jeff Rain Rainey, and please correct me if I mispronounce your name. Rain is perfect. All right. And then uh, Todd Jackson, you're on deck. Hello, I'm Jeff Rain. I'm in many things, I guess. I'm a resident of District 6, so I'm one of Alex Wands. I am a Midtown and Morningside Elementary dad, and I also own a few properties and made the wise decision to let a professional, uh, such as we've heard before, uh, manage it because I knew we couldn't manage it and keep uh, the high quality of standard that we would appreciate. So I think there's a, a very important constituency in the room and that I would encourage and urge the professional uh, bureaucratic staff to look into 
really collaborating with the professionals. Because what I hear from this audience is that there are two main concerns. One is bad social behavior, bad actors, parties, you know, spin outs, drug deals, what have you. That's a behavior that we seek to limit. We don't seek to limit a quantity or a number of properties, but the behavior of the management of those properties. And the second is, as uh, the now absent Councilman Lewis noted, we have a rising crisis of housing cost. Well, for that, we need to look at land use. And we need to look at what we're doing with our fives. And we need to invest in the missing middle which every day, if you read the blogs, you see NIMBYs every day, you know, resisting the change, resisting density, resisting growing transit-oriented development in districts. And that's the change we need. A few hundred units isn't going to make the difference in Mr. Lewis's district. What's gonna make the, dif the difference is if we invest in infrastructure and we build and we get denser. So, 12 seconds left. Thank you for the time, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, uh, Todd Jackson, followed by uh, Eden D'Artois. Eden D'Artois, we will uh, make sure I'm corrected on that, but Todd Jackson. All right, uh, Miss Eden. Actually, it's Mr. Eden. Um, some, Matt, this, this is why you shouldn't assume. Don't I sweat it. I get it all the time. How you doing? Um, I don't have much to say. Everything's been said for me. I just want to thank you guys for having this meeting. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And last but not least, Stephanie Parker. Thank you guys for having this meeting. I am, I live in uh, Mr. Lewis's district. Um, so I'm glad that he was here. And I actually live in a home that months ago had a shootout because there was gang members. And I actually had to hit the floor because I didn't know what was going on. And so my neighborhood is pretty quiet. And I saw a lot of cars driving by. I didn't know what was going on and this home actually had cameras outside. It was featured on the news as well. AK-47s, all type of things that you wouldn't even imagine that would be on the street. It was in this home. And right across the street from this home is an apartment complex filled with children that could have been outside, could have been killed. So respectfully, I like Airbnb. I actually was an Airbnb owner. Um, and I was a super host. I did this out of my own home. I was living there. Because I had skin in the game, there was no issues ever at my home. This home that had the shootout with cameras, the homeowner is not around. So why should we in our neighborhood feel like we're prisoners because other people can come in, drop a home, and live in Alpharetta and we have to stay there and pick up the pieces. It's not fair. You guys have to protect the homeowners. And I think people who want to do Airbnb should be at, it was intended. Airbnb was intended to have, to run out extra space in your home. That's what it was about. Not creating small hotel areas, and we have to suffer the consequences. Think about your homeowners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. And thank you to the members of the public for joining us uh, today. Uh, I know we had a lively discussion, lively debate, lively conversation. Thank you to colleagues uh, for joining us and, and being a part of this. Um, uh, Council Member Overshaw, I'll let you get the final words and then we'll move on to adjournment. Okay. Um, I too want to say thank you to everyone. Um, you know, perspective is everything and it is good to hear uh, different viewpoints about something so important to the city. So I appreciate all comments, uh, regardless of whether I agree with all of them or any of them. Um, I, I definitely like to hear different perspectives because we only know uh, what we live most of the time. So um, I'm thankful for those, um, all of the comments from both city planning and everyone that actually spoke today. Um, I also want to reiterate that our designated person is going to be um, Elisa.
Baker, and that's a Baker at AtlantaGA.gov. Um, just want to put that out there. And I also want everyone to know that you can look at this particular uh, work session on uh, our social media platforms in its entirety at your own leisure um, because it was recorded today and that's important. But um, with that being said, hopefully we will have uh, more discussion, but um, <laughs> We won't have another work session, I don't think, um, but we will have the proper discussion so that we can uh, get this legislation shored up as soon as possible um, so that those the efforts that you all are so desperately needed, needing um, will actually be in place soon because the city um, definitely uh, need to deliver that to you. And so we're on the right page with that. So with all of that, thank you. Uh, we are adjourned. Um, well, Council President, do you have anything you'd like to say before we go? No. Nope. All right. With that, thank you, City Planning. Thanks, everyone.